Remember, remember, the 17th of August. V for Vendetta, our plot. The comic was better, but V for Vendetta should never be forgot. Hey folks, I'm Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of love. And with these words, I break rules one and two and bring you the worst kept secret on the internet. Since 2003, when an American teenager decided he wanted to try and emulate a Japanese picture message forum website, image boards have become the driving force in our culture. Sadly, this has not always been a good thing. But where it is a force for good is that it birthed the anonymous movement. And where did they get their iconography? Why, from the Guy Fawkes styled masks that were made famous by the movie V for Vendetta. Released in the USA in 2005, and the following March in the UK, V for Vendetta is an adaptation of the original comic written by Alan Moore. Though, as ever, Moore distanced himself from this adaptation, having been burned with the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen adaptation, which I reviewed early in 2012. But before we get to the film itself, let us discuss the genesis of the project. Alan Moore, a former abattoir assistant, visionary writer and novelist, and most recently a magician of sorts. During the turbulent 1980s, Moore worked for a number of comic book companies, from Marvel UK to the British giants of DC Thompson and IPC. Not forgetting, of course, Fleetway's 2000 AD. But it was the comic anthology Warrior where two of Moore's best-known stories, at least among some circles, were published. These tales were V for Vendetta and Marvel Man. While the tale of Marvel Man is a long and winding yarn, it is not our primary focus. The first instalment of V for Vendetta was published in the comic anthology Warrior in March of 1982. However, the entire run of V for Vendetta was not published in Warrior, as in 1985, the title was cancelled, with two completed issues unpublished. It would be three years until the story was continued by DC Comics, as six reprint issues, followed by all new material in issue seven. The tale was finally concluded with the May 1989 issue. The original graphic novel, V for Vendetta, is a heavy work, as much of Alan Moore's full-length tales are wont to be, depicting the battle between anarchy in the body of V and fascism in the form of the North Fire government led by High Chancellor Adam Susan. It was also meant to be morally ambiguous, to leave you in doubt as to whether V was terrorist or freedom fighter. It was not long after the completion of V for Vendetta when producer Joel Silver optioned the movie rights, along with those of Moore's superhero deconstruction epic, Watchmen. A first draft was written, which bore little, if any, resemblance to the graphic novel upon which it was based. And so the project languished in development hell, until at least the mid-90s, when the Wachowski brothers, now the Wachowski sisters, began work on their Matrix project. They too were fans of V for Vendetta, and wrote another draft script. This one was much more faithful, and though it didn't immediately get made, it formed the basis for the movie that did. But there is another topic to cover before we reach the adaptation. As I mentioned, V for Vendetta is a meditation on the battle between anarchy and fascism. And nowhere is this battle more starkly portrayed than right here on the internet. On the side of control, national governments and multinational corporations. And on the side of chaos, the multitudinous masses and masters of massively multiplayer mayhem known simply as Anonymous. The tale of the Anonymous movement spans all the way back to Japan of 1999, when a Japanese man in Arkansas set up a message board which he called 2Channel. This message board differed from most Western forums, 
in that posters were not required to register a screen name, and many posters quite happily posted with none. Now, the name 2-channel refers to the RF modulators in old CRT televisions, which would receive signals from game consoles such as the Famicom, which I don't need to tell you is the Japanese equivalent of the NES, on Channel 2. Sadly, in 2001, 2 Channel fell on hard times, and looked like it was heading to be shut down. In response to this, a group of concerned 2 Channel users set up Futaba Channel. Or, as the world would come to know it, 2chan. 2chan is an image board, rather than a message board, in that each thread is begun with an image, rather than a simple text message. This will occasionally lead to some threads being started with an unrelated image, though this is mostly kept to sections where the topic of conversation is flexible. Today, 2chan and 2channel still coexist. 2channel making about 100 million yen annually for its creator. And it was in 2003, as I mentioned in the introduction, that an enterprising fellow who gives his name as Christopher Poole brought this idea to the English-speaking world. But how did a forum that was planned as a safe space to discuss anime give rise to the anarchic collective known as Anonymous? Well, this is all due to a particular quirk of the image board system. The image board software that runs 2chan and 4chan is based upon the 2channel script, the same script that allows anonymous posting, and, as in the East, so in the West. Most posters prefer to post anonymously, being identified either by their post number, or more recently, a random code. Indeed, visitors to the infamous random board, the internet's worst kept secret, are allowed no identifiable name. This is, however, more due to the status of the board's artistic works of fiction and falsehood, rather than any attempt to create a utopian society without the burden of identity. And so it was that with the freedom of anonymity, firstly merry pranksters came to play, leading japes and sending pizzas and other unsolicited items to people, asking video game outlets if they had battle toads, and other such light-hearted fodder. The more serious activist side of Anonymous first emerged in 2006, when the collective used denial of service and phone pranking to disrupt the actions of American white supremacist Hal Turner. Turner tried to sue the Anonymous activists who attacked his site, but in 2007 the case was dismissed as it had failed to move forward. Flush with their first success, Anonymous then set their sights on the Church of Scientology. This was in response to a misposted supposedly internal video featuring Tom Cruise in frank discussion of what the church means to him. The protests spiralled offline and onto the streets. This is where the image of Guy Fawkes, the infamous V mask, becomes inexorably intertwined with the movement, as thousands of protesters used the mask to hide their identity from the litigious eyes of Scientologist investigators. Further targets of Anonymous ranged from the American music and movie industry bodies to security firm H.B. Gary, and everybody's least favourite extremist Christian sect, the Westboro Baptist Church. Recently though, their grand ideals have begun to overreach their abilities. They threatened to wipe Israel off the internet in early 2013, but the actual damage was limited. Whether we have seen the last of the great Anonymous Crusades or not, I cannot say. But I do know that the lasting legacy of Anonymous is that they have stirred many people to care about politics and the world they live in once more. And that is an encouraging thought. All of which brings us to the actual point of this video, the 2005 and 2006 movie V for Vendetta. The thing to keep in mind is that this movie is an adaptation, a difference to the original sequentially told tale. In the original comic, it would be quite plausible that the tale of Valerie Page was in fact the tale of V herself, owing to the many hints scattered throughout the staging, such as V's lighted mirror, the taking of the first letter of her former name, as was done in Men in Black to the character of James Darrell Edwards, 
The belief that a lie can be used in the telling of the truth, for we only have V's word that Page was in the next cell to his. However, the Valerie Page theory is irrevocably refuted in the casting of firstly James Purefoy, who left the role early in filming, and then Hugo Weaving as the body of V. Further to this, in the memoirs of another character, a test subject who is hinted to be V is specifically gendered as male. Gordon Dietrich, while not entirely cut from whole cloth, being that his character was adapted from a similarly named Gordon in the original comic, is rather a lot like the J. Leno, Conan O'Brien, Craig Ferguson type late night chat show hosts that America assumes we must have over here. Which we do, after a fashion, but still. This leads back to a quote from Moore himself, that this adaptation bears more of a significance to Bush-era America than the original comic, which was set in a post-nuclear Britain, whereas the movie is set in a post-viral epidemic Britain. Stephen Fry is, as ever, his charming self in this role, even as the character sets out upon a road to self-destruction, a road which is eerily similar to Mr Fry's own opposition to recent events in Russia as of August 2013. Roger Allen's slimy Lewis Prothero, wild-eyed and limbo-esque, makes for a great satire on what a televisual version of the Daily Mail would look like. Stephen Rees' world-weary Chief Inspector Finch adds an air of down-at-heel police procedural to this vicious cabaret, as his dogged determination to discover the real truth of Larkhill and what it has to do with V plays itself out, even as the anarchy descends across London. And so we end this discussion with a final summary of my opinions on the movie V for Vendetta. This is not the graphic novel upon which it was based, however, the graphic novel was not the catalyst for a digital revolution. Could I truly say that this one was? Not with any kind of authority. Alan Moore did not predict the internet. All he did was create a tale where a lone anarchist fought the law in a fascist state and in a shocking break with tradition, Z1. The film itself retains some elements of the comic, the central protagonist, the main thrust of the story, and of course the conceit that ideas are bulletproof. And yes, it is much more of a metaphor on neoconservatism and the way that America has lost its way, but as a film in its own right, it's still damn powerful, and moving, and brutal, and beautiful. All that I can say is that I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason, or digital disobedience, or any form of popular uprising for that matter, should ever be forgot. I've been Funky Monkey, and I stand against fascism, darkness, and evil in all its many forms. Bless you all, and evil shall burn. So long, folks. <laughs>